play that because well, I'll get a, a strike against me for playing things that are um, public domain. I'll talk about that. Not public domain. Under authorship. Yes, today I'm going to talk about some things that have been um, on the channel asked about. I'll answer your questions later, but more importantly, I'm going to answer this question. Haley Williamson plus others have posted the question, if a piece does not give you fingerings, how do you know if you shift or not? And it's been asked many times, and I've been saying I will answer it. And I'm now going to answer it with musical examples. Now. Let's preface this for a little bit. I'm going to play a various set of songs, but I just played one for you right here. I'll go back to what the song I just played called Beautiful Dreamer. And I'll zoom in real close so you can see it. I hope you can. Here. How do you know when to shift? The answer is as simple as four words. Does it fit in first. Okay, that was five words. Does it fit in first? And what do I mean by that? You must know your first position. That's all these notes here. And to better explain this, I'm going to switch to my electro cello with the tape. So bear with me. And if you're tuning in to this very impromptu live stream, hello to you. Good morning. Good evening. Good morning, good day, good evening, and good night. It is the evening time here, the wonderful place where I live here in France. And I invite you to learn something today with us. So, the question has been posed. Let's look at it one more time. Haley. Thank you, Haley. Wherever you are in the world, thank you. If a piece does not give you fingerings, how do you know if you shift or not? Now here in Beautiful Dreamer, I have given you the fingerings. Yes. And the fingerings, as you, many of you read these fingerings, they are what tells you what to do. I'll even look much closer into here. And how you know what those fingerings mean, you know your scales. This is in the key of C major. And because it's in C major, I play a two here. And that first note is two, and then the second note is one, and the next note is two. But if there were no fingerings, I'm going to erase those right now. How do you know? It's in first position. Or moreover, second right here. Again, if you know your first position, you would know that that's a zero plus four, which I'm erasing zero and then another zero. 
So I'm going to just highlight these first two measures of Beautiful Dreamer. And with no fingerings, you already know because you know your scales, you know that this is simply put like that here in the first position two one two four one zero plus four zero zero those are the numbers that associate with the first position fingerings and so the question I ask is does it fit in first of course it does and if you want to be more advanced about it can you play it elsewhere now because I already made these fingerings in the first position I will show you the way that I would play this song and I'll play it one more time now if you're joining us late hello I am I'm playing beautiful dreamer and if you're just joining us hey hi wherever you are in the world I'll read your comments later this is the way I would play it instead of here I'll play it more here <laughs> To highlight exactly what it did, I'll just go back to the beginning and put in the fingerings I just played. Now the app I'm using is called Fourscore. If you have an iPad, then well, there is no reason that you should be using any other app but this. This is an app I've been using since 2001. I don't get any money from these people. All I know is it is the best app available. And I'm putting in the fingerings. Right here, there's a two, there's a two, and there's a two here, and there's a one here. And because I use colored brackets, so there you go. There's the fingerings I just played. And I'll play it one more time. Now, if you were to open this up and, and look at this, you would say, okay. I know in first position, that first note here, I'm going to go really close now. I know in first position, this note right here, right here, is a two. And as you see right there, there, there is the two. But I see a four. And it's impossible, really, unless you're playing Will on the Nut, to play a four here. So, question is asked, does it fit in first? And the answer is no, because there's a four there. And then you see the next note. If there was nothing there, it would be a one. And the next one would be a two, and the next one would be a four. But instead, we have different numbers. And that means a three here, a four here, and then a one on where I put my four. Does it fit in first? No, that means it's a different position. And how do you know this? You know this by knowing your scales. So I'm going to go erase all of this, clear that out, and that is what you have in really the first position. Now let's go into a part that, the secondary part that I make more advanced, and take a look at this. If you know your scales, which is incredibly important, you have memorized these 16 notes across here, then you know the first three notes, and then the next note right here, this note, is an E. That's okay. It's a me. That's this note here. That is usually with the third finger, but you see a one. Does it fit in first? No, it doesn't. And there's a four afterward, and then a two. These three notes are not in first position, hence it is a shift. It's as simple as that. 
Now the question was more posed, what if you don't have, what if you don't have any fingerings? What if you simply, I'm going to pull up something, um, we'll pull this up, here we go. <laughs> It's something uh, I've been working on. So this is um, a good example right here. The top part or the bottom part. Or you can even look here at the bottom part. I'll, I'll just look right here. We have a note that is has two ledger lines. And it's a good example because this note right here, looking very close, that note, if you know your scales, that note is right here not in first position and though it forces you to play outside of first so the question does it fit in first it does not and so this song without fingerings i'll, I'll bring that out so i'll play a little bit of that for you again Now the question you were asking is, well, how do you know to move your hand here and there? Well, you know by training the different positions. In my mind, as I look at this, and as you notice what I did at the beginning, I want to go back to this, just these four notes. So when you practice, when you improve, be very specific. I started basically first, fourth position. I did that. I'm like, okay, that worked. But then... I tweaked it a little bit. I improved it. And I played a one. I'll just do the fingerings now. A one here in the fourth position. A four here in on the D string. And then sliding back four and then putting the second finger here in first. And how you become good at this is with practice. You start to find out what sounds good and with your experience. So instead of going, I'm going, and it's more smooth. So that is how you would know you play something not in first position. And I'm going to just go pull up a completely different one pull up a random one um, without fingerings. That, that was the rule. No fingerings. This has been in my mind for any one of you guys that requested that. See, here's some fingerings. Yes. And I put some fingerings here. Now, what I'm going to do is just play this little passage for you without the fingerings. I'm going to just eliminate those. There they go. They're away. For those of you who like rugby, congratulations to South Africa, you won. Commiserations to the England, sorry, another time. At least you made it to the final. Now I'm going to start here in this measure right here, okay? And so we're going to, again, I know that this is in C major. There's a key signature right here. No accidentals, so I'm going to just play what I know C major. I know I'm playing second finger here, I'm playing three here, I'm playing fours. There's no extensions, no nothing. And because it's in bass clef, okay, here we go. <laughs> first position. So Haley wants to know, when do you know to shift or not? Well, Haley, the answer is, can you play it a little more smoothly? Let's look at measure 153, particularly here. I'm going to leave the answer away because I already answered it for one of my students. This right here. Okay, okay, it's a little, little, you have a triplet in there. Hmm, 
Can that play be played on the same string? A little more smooth? Yes? I think so. Hey, that only can only that can also be played, excuse me, in the same string, it can be played in the same position. Instead of if any of you have watched my video about the three S's, it's shifting, stretching, and string crosses. Three things that make cello difficult. And if you were to set up this, this couple of measures right here, you would find that this, that is more difficult as opposed to, yes. And so it sounds a little bit better too. Now I'll give you the answers. This is what the fingerings are. And it's a, just a simple shift. That's what it is. What do you guys think of this cello here? <laughs> Again, how do you know when to shift or not? I'm trying to find music without fingerings. <laughs> I'm, uh, there sh you should always put fingerings in your music. Always, always, always. Um, that shows that you practice it. If you ever show up to like orchestra rehearsal and the person pulls out music and you know what I'm talking about, you, you, you sit next to someone and they they don't have any fingerings, no bowings, no nothing. They haven't practiced, or they're probably really good at cello, that they don't need to. No, 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 no. We all put in f fingerings, all of us. All of us do that. And so I'm trying to find something, anything that will, that will show this a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I haven't played this in a while. Oh, it's a good example right here. Sostakovich. And as we have, I'll just erase real quick the fingerings. How do you know when to shift? Did you see what I just, I just did? I removed them. But you see there's an open A there. First, let's keep kept the key signature. Check it. It's in D major, two sharps. So that means these notes we played here, these threes we played here again, you're, you have memorized your three off, your three up to three sharps, three flats. You have to memorize them. There's no shortcuts in cello music. You have to do this and to go this quick. And so, just playing it, knowing what it is. I'm gonna erase a little bit of that. It starts with a four, but I'm even gonna erase that right there. That's suggested. There we go. I'm already playing the fingerings. And then it goes a little bit. And those are the next notes right there. This is from a movie called The Gadfly. It was inspired, Shostakovich was inspired by, by Masane. Um, and so he wrote this in the in the vein of Massenet. Now, looking at this, can this be played without those open A's, which is really obvious on this cello? Maybe. I know that if I play a four, which is answered here, okay, there's a four, I can play that here. And the next note, if you know your upper second position, which is the second level, you know your all these fingerings here, and then you say, okay, what options do I have? Do you know your upper second? I have a video about that, check it out. Check out the video, the whole book, buy it, called The Position Pieces by Rick Mooney. It's incredibly important, okay? This is the upper second position. I call it two on the four. This is your four, put your two there. When you do that, you render the next string. I can play that without leaving the string I'm playing on. So right here, I can play that. But the next note, the next note doesn't allow me to play that. So I need to be playing four quick notes 
within the context of legato without a shift. Can that be done? Well, it can be done here. And that is what the fingerings have been written by my old student. That is how you know when to shift. You know your positions, you know your first, does it fit in first? You ask that question. And when you get more advanced, you start to say, well, those are a bunch of fast notes within the legato. You don't shift within the legato. Can it be played more smoothly? So I guess the first question is, you know, does it fit in first? Okay. It doesn't, so it's in a different position. How smooth, how easy can I make this played? And that's really important. On cello, we're always looking for opportunities to play as smooth as possible. Um, I have some something else here. I, here, again, lots of fingerings because I love to do that. And here, an evening pray prayer by Engelbert Humperdinck. Let's see if I can erase this. Oh, I can. <laughs> so right here, the beginning of this beautiful. By the way, if you've ever sit, heard this before, watch it. It's great. The original German is um. Well, that's not that's not the original German. You're not gonna see it. This is how it's played. Now, it's a lot of movement back and forth. You know you have to get out of first position there. Can you play it without such a big jump? Oh, I mean, it's difficult, you know? Imagine doing that over and over again. You would have to find a different place. So when you're forced to not play in first, look at the notes around it. So first rule is, does it fit in first? Second is how smoothly can it be played? And how we know that is we will look at the notes around it. Where is the phrase going? And where is the phrase coming from? And it looks like right here, these notes here, particularly those two C's, can be played here in the fourth position on the D string. And that is what I have marked. That is how you know a little bit about how like when you know not to play in first, when you know to shift. Remember, does it fit in first? Well, right here, it doesn't. Look how many ledger lines there are. There's a lot. Why do we use tenor clef? Because that is a lot of ledger lines, okay? I shift to a one there. Look at the notes that come after. Why do I shift to a four there? Well, it's obviously there. So again, you must be present today, as in you must be present in the notes you're playing, but also in the future. You must be always looking to the future. Which brings me to my next example, which I was teaching one of my students and I was gonna bring it up real quick. So I've always been asked like, how do I not squeak? How do I not squeak? And I believe this is it. This right here. Simple song, it's an arrangement, easy arrangement of uh, Bach. passage right here, let's look at this right here. There is a little part where I play the open A, and I want to get real close. These are these, these notes I'm playing. I make it seem easy, because what I'm doing is I'm lifting as much as possible underneath my hand. So I'm keeping the fourth finger down, it never leaves. But what happens?
happens if I don't lift enough and I don't know these notes? <laughs> Let's say I'm thinking about it, okay? I don't know these notes and I put notes in front of me I've never seen before. I'll start in five. You know those sounds. squeaky sound that you make on cello have a lot to do with how much brain power you're putting into different parts of your body, as in this part and this part. If I didn't know those notes, it would sound more like... This is easy. <laughs> there, it would, there it would go. I would have, I would have my fingers touching here on this other string. So really, how do you not squeak? If you take this bow and you put it down and you do it pizzicato. Pizzicato is, especially with this, with open strings. You hear that? Now it's gone. When you play cello, not only do you have to space your fingers, find the note, but you also have to be aware of the fat on your fingers. Yes, your fingers are fat. You, your fatty fingers, and we all have good fat on our fingers, will touch, make those, those sounds. And especially if you're playing, if you're not playing, if you're not pushing down all the way, that's going to be a problem as well. Know the notes so you play at a pace that I say to all my students, play at a speed that it is impossible. For you to make a mistake. Ooh, a buzz. It's difficult. It's difficult to really play at a speed that you never make a mistake. I make this example a lot with my students. Let's see if I can get in into the into the more into the screen to really show you what I'm talking about. All right. When you're playing, imagine this bow here. Here we go. Imagine your bow is your brain. Your this is your this is your brain on cello. Ah, <laughs> uh, this is your brain, and this is your brain. On cello. <laughs> Sorry, that's a stupid joke. Um, uh, anyway, back to this. Uh, for those of you who grew up in the 80s, you know what I'm talking about. In the 90s too. If you're a 90s kid, 80s kid, you know what I'm talking about. They don't do that anymore. All right, this is your brain. Back to this. Now, why have I shown you this? Imagine that we've all been there. You go to a playground, and if you haven't been to a playground in a wild place where children play, don't go there alone. Go over there with kids, um, and find the teeter totter, the seesaw, or just watch people play on it. What happens when you have this? You have one kid on one side that's acting silly. Well, the kid on the other side is stuck, and they kind of wiggle. If there isn't an agreement between the two, if you kind of do this too hard. Something always happens on the other side. In cello, if you are unbalanced, lacking confidence, or maybe putting too much bandwidth, I say, bandwidth, into your left side, so you don't know your fingerings and your eyes are getting wide, then your bow is going to lose. You're gonna, you're gonna lose, it's gonna be very, well, it's gonna be light, it's gonna be all over the place. And, 
On the inverse, if you are playing and you really don't know your bowings, your fingerings are going to be out unless you've already established your fingerings. That's important. So when you practice something and you pick it up for the very first time and you have never seen it before, I have literally never played this before, okay? This is the Gamma Sanata from Bach. Um, right. I've never played this before, so I'm literally going to play it right now. And I'll use this rule. It's Adagio, it's Bach, 12-8 in E minor. How do I know those things? Because E minor is the relative major, minor for G major. And it starts here. I'm not going to do the bowing because I don't just want to see where I'm going. how I changed my fingers because I thought there may be a B coming up <laughs> like that. So I think I'm confident enough to play this passage with the bow. It's slow. Now I'm going to try it with the bow. You see, this side of my seesaw is now equal. Now I have, now I can put more energy right here. I can put more thinking about what I'm about to do. I see it's piano, it's dolce, so smooth, sweetly. so forth and so on. So when you play like that, you're able to give, this hand is already taken care of, so even if you push down a little bit and you're really giving more time to that part, well, you're okay over here. So the rule of not squeaking is preparation, is knowing that this, this fluid, it's very fluid when you're learning, and you have to sort out your fingerings before you sort out your bow. Or maybe sort out your bow before you sort out your fingerings. Now this is something a lot of you play. I was teaching one of my students today. And if you don't have it sorted, then it's not going to sound good. Where are you? Where are you, Simon? There we go. And here it is. Suzuki Book One. A lot of you who are familiar with Suzuki Book One want to go to a song that a lot of us... <laughs> here it is. This song right here is called Perpetual Motion in D Major. Now, if you know this song, okay, like that. But what if you don't know this? Because what I'm doing a little slowly there in the second measure, I'm lifting my hand a little bit. My bow needs to be a hundred percent because I'm really thinking about these fingerings or am I? What is the more challenge with this song? Is it the bowing or is it the fingering or is it the coordination of both? And that's a great thing about etudes like this is that your fingerings must be on lock. They must be really known and your bowing must be really known. Your bow technique, short strokes as they correct, they ask you to do. So in the end, you're balancing, you're coordinating bow with fingerings. So when you double it up, what am I thinking about? I'm honestly thinking about 
you hear, and I'm placing my fingers nice and firm so I get a good sound. I could give you example after example after example, but um, that's essentially all what it is. know your fingerings for this, but particularly right here, it's not the fingering so much, it's the bow. You keep your second finger down the whole time and you're really angling your hand up. So I've already have the confidence enough, I've leveled out this side, I'm not thinking about it because I moved my hand up on the inside, my thumb here. It doesn't move there all the time. and. All you have to do is then think about the bow stroke. And like that. A lot of preparation. Yes, you, before I get to any of your questions, if you ask them, thank you. Um, you, as a cello player, are playing a high art. This is not an easy thing to do. I'm going to say that as it is. If you succeed, and with every little success you do, every win you do, congratulations. You know that you have done something good, especially if you really play, you know, that really pretty... Can I get back? <laughs> Oh my gosh, hope I can get back in there. <laughs> huh? I am back? Really? You see me? <laughs> I'm back? Oh my gosh, the computer crashed. <laughs> I can't believe that happened. <laughs> like, it was good, and then boom, it wasn't good. Oh man, that's embarrassing. First world problems, right? <laughs> ah. All right, I'll get to some of your questions. If you have asked them, thank you. Sorry for the computer crashing. <laughs> oh my gosh. <clears throat> right, I'll get to some of your questions. Hi, hi everyone, wherever you're tuning in from, hello. Good morning, good day, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. I'm going to put my bow in a safe place. There's so many things you could talk about. I mean, I could talk about this forever. You know, I've been teaching since 1997. And there's little things like this. Always, the first thing you do is you put your bow away. You always put your bow away. You will knock it off your stand. You will break the tip. These are things you will do. It is the first thing to always do. Now the cello always goes in, pin, in, in their respective areas. But, oh, jeezy, crazy. The bow. Always put your bow away. If you're not playing, actively playing your cello, put your bow away. All right. I can't believe I, I can't believe I did that. So, uh, right, going from the top here. Hello to everyone. Hello from France. Hello Anne, Braden. Hello Braden. Braden B. Hello from Oregon. Got some. Hello Chile. Scotland's been here. Uh, thank you, Monique Stamper. 
Nihaima? Nihaima. Monique, thank you. I, can I like like any of these things? Because I don't, I don't, so I, I, I don't do that. Um, hello from Maui. You know, I've been to Hawaii and it's wonderful. I absolutely love it. Hello. Well, thank you, Lopaka. Lopaka gave a super chat. Thank you. He says, digging the Yamaha and loving the lesson, brother. Well, Lopaka, I'm glad that you like it too. I really do. Um, and it's wonderful that this, um, that the universe has connected us all together. And if you are people of faith, you can just say the Lord has connected us together because it is a true blessing to play music. And so, uh, Final Fantasy Girl, you know I did this for you. I'm just going to keep it real. You kept asking the question, and I hope I help you answer. So I want to keep scrolling down, <laughs> and hopefully I answered your question. There's some of you, if you have and asked those questions. Hello, Sally. Hello, Ro Roko. Um... There is no, Charles says, there is no such speed that I cannot make a mistake. Oh, yes, there is. Yes, there is. Um, you can play at a lethargic pace, but you could definitely play. I know, right? Um, and he, thank you, everyone. You know, I, I really want to tell all of you that, I'm going to quit that. Um, yes, the arpeggio guy. Brandon, you asked about the arpeggios if you're still watching. I want to scroll down if you're kept watching. Thunderstruck by, <laughs> by two cellos. You know I'd love to play that. I actually don't know. Um, I don't know the version of it, but I know the ACDC version. It's all gonna come. It's all gonna come. Don't you worry. I have things in the process. You're welcome, Wanju. You're welcome. All right. So, hi again. I hope that worked. Did that work? Did I get through? Oh, whoa, whoa, hey, there it goes. Jersey, Jersey, hello, Jersey, hello, Portland. Where am I from, Final So Final Fantasy Girl, um, that was your question. I oh, hope I asked that question. So Brayden, hi you Brayden. I'm still watching and still wondering about chords and arpeggios. Brayden asked a question about arpeggios. Why do we play arpeggios? Um, hello Paula. Most of my music is on MuseScore, Paula. We play arpeggios and this is something you should really consider. We have two things that really are the foundation of how we, why we play cello. We play, pull up my quote of what for this. We play cello, we play the scales, right? To, to just really give us the, like the alphabet. Okay? The ABCs. Think about uh, scales is like a map, okay? And the map is the map of, let's say, your, your hometown, wherever you live. And I give you a map. I said, here you go. You come to France. You ever do? I live in France. And uh, I give you a map to my hometown, my town I live in. And, and here you go. Do you know where to go? Do you know what to do? Well, you can figure out your way, use GPS. But before there was GPS, you needed to have directions. And then the best, most efficient way of getting from one place to the next, if you can make shortcuts. An arpeggio is just like that. An arpeggio is something that trains the positions and the shifts. More important, the shifts, okay? So an arpeggio, which is very much like this. <laughs> Four, one, four, two. And I was doing this recently with a student, teaching them that. And then the next octave 
is here. Now, if I do it slowly, I'll do a little slower. Notice that the first finger, Brayden, is here already. And notice I end on two fingers. And then I shift up, and the goal is to shift up with two fingers down. I'm already ready in position. My hand is hoisted, and my second finger is on the G natural. The G natural B is here, and the G natural B is here. So when I do an arpeggio, see, that wasn't trained. Here it is. And there it is. important form of the hand and it, and it really travels into excuse me it connects with our technique for chords we play a chord if you're able to if you're able to make those pretty trains choo -choo, to make all of them sound good. Double stops is a type of chord as well. When you're able to play them well, then you're good. And we train these to really train the shape of the hand, the form of the hand. You already know your fingerings. Now you're really fine tuning. <laughs> chords to really fine-tune. Do the arpeggio to get you more accurately shifting in between positions because the fingers are a consequence of what you're doing. You're not thinking about one, three, one, three, two. You're not thinking about that. You're thinking about this shape here, this shape here, and a two octave arpeggio. Three octave arpeggio will go up like that. Hope it helped answer your question. I'll go back to the comments now. So that's the really basic, I'll make a video particularly talking more about that when I teach the arpeggios from my scale book about why we do arpeggios. And the last thing about arpeggios, it's a 4-1-4-2. You can play arpe every arpeggio, major arpeggio like that. I'll play my 4 right here on the A. I'll play it on the A flat. I'll play it on the G. music, arpeggios. It's the first, the third, and the fifth quality of, of a scale, which are the perfect, you know, the perfect things. Hey, <laughs> you, you want me to play more of it? I can play more of it. Of course I can play more of it. Um, but da -da -da -da. I, I took the music away, which is, I, I shouldn't have done that. So, Sarah, I'm going to pull up Sarah's music. Here we go. So I'm going to go back up. Um, I'm going to go see if you... So here we go. How do you feel about Larson Mediums AD over Yager AD? Lopaka asks. Lopaka, um, it depends on your cello. Everybody who asks questions about how do you feel about this and that, I am a big fan of Yarger's. I think they're the Toyota of um, the most reliable strings, most most predictable strings, and they're they're not expensive. The Dario uh, Preludes are great too, but I really suggest that you guys um, uh, find it find a string that is good for you. Yarger's are good in middle range. They're made in Denmark, and so are Larsen's. I consider the best strings in the world are made in Denmark. I don't get paid. I just figure that's that's my 
personal <laughs> 30 some odd years playing the instrument when the first time I get yarders on one of my cellos I said well this these are strings these are strings so um, I think that Yarger's aren't as good as Larson's. And I, if you want to personally ask, I consider Larson's the Lexus of the string world. Incredibly reliable, predictable, and high, high quality. If you take Toyota and just make it better. Yeah, that's really it. Hello, Khan. Thank you for tuning in. Night, night, Sally. So he's looking for a warmer sound than the A, and especially the, especially the A. The warmth that you're looking for, it's going to have to do a lot with your cello. One of my students recently bought a cello from Edgar Rus, by the way, my friend in Cremona. You saw the videos, our inter interviews. I love the guy made this cello. And at one point, he's playing uh, Sound of Silence, and he's... He gets to a part where he's playing the notes correctly. And it's not that, but it's something. And he just doesn't, he's like, it doesn't sound good. I'm like, okay, what do you want? He's like, I want it to sound better. I'm like, your quality of your cello. As simple as that. It's the quality of your cello. So you don't have the ability to upgrade your cello. If you want a warmer tone and you've already changed a string, consider... Uh, maybe a different bridge. I'll make a video one day about Aubert and um, Dispal bridges. They're made here in France. And I'll actually go to the factory here in Aubert, here in France, and I'll show you what they... They've been making bridges forever. The strings, the tailpiece is a big deal. You can um, do that. But if you're really looking for a warmer tone, you're going to have to find... If you're looking for that and you know what it is, and you, maybe you hear, but don't don't go and like compare your cello to what you hear. You got to go to a luthier, and you've got to listen to cellos there. And if you find that tone that you want, then that's what you want. And there's a price to that. If you want something with a played that passage from Dvorak's cello concerto on this cello I knew there was something special and there was a price tag that came with it if you look into Edgar Rus's price categories he personally made this so you know w w the sacrifice I made to have a cello like this but even so you can get more more from a cello that doesn't have to cost a lot of money with proper strings and with proper bridge and proper tailpiece, little things like that. And just really, honestly, to goodness, playing it a lot. The black cello that I covered on this channel, it owns, owned by a lady here in France, and she loves it. She will never get rid of it. She bought that thing, and she's played it, and she's beat, the, beat, it, <laughs> beat it down. She loves it. And it has a warm tone. It has a quiet tone, but it has a warm tone. Because she has played it a lot. You have to play your cello. You have to engage with it. I don't know, it's really simple, but that's what it is. You're welcome. You're welcome very much, Final um, Brandon B. So, I'll play a little more of some Sechabons. It's the oft ignored. <laughs>
Here's the thing about vibrato and Baroque music. It wasn't used. You don't play vibrato in Baroque music. So all you, every time you see a person... <laughs> you don't use vibrato in Baroque music. You're supposed to enjoy the resonance of it. It was a very different world back then. Salon music. And so what I do usually, I like to... Oh, you want it! And I give it at the very end. <laughs> So there's the Sechabons from the first suites. Like that, like that, like that. Up. Keep to your questions. There you are. That was for you, Ned Grant. So Patrick, hello, Patrick. Question from him. I have a kind of beginner question. I'm learning to play the cello for three months, and the A string is the hardest string for me. Always crooked, always squeaky. Any tips? Well, earlier in this live stream, I talked about squeakiness. But in, in, and understand this, you have four strings and you have 120 pounds of pressure, which I don't know how that translates into kilos, but that is a lot of pressure on, on this. And you really have to engage the A. I don't say play hard, I say engage your A string. And so you can't be afraid of it. You gotta get into it, okay? <laughs> your A string and if you're at all timid <laughs> sorry <laughs> if you don't know what you're doing and you're, you're there's too much here uh, you're, you're going to squeak you're going to squeak you have to push down <laughs> video on that this upcoming probably this month or next month about particularly when you play cello you have to play the note prior during and after so like in the box suite just that alone and in the second part you are playing a chord are down engaging the cello and you don't play it's a fallacy you don't play Patrick you don't play a stringed instrument you play a wooden instrument you're playing this engage the fingerboard when you push down do you feel the fingerboard I don't the string is a consequence it's the fingerboard To play the other three strings seems to be for more comfortable as to play the note A feels like I'm going to stab someone standing behind me. Kind of hard to explain. Um. <laughs> Here's the thing about those wonderful sounds. I have to tell you guys, those squeaking, this, I love them. I, as a teacher, I love when you squeak. You have to squeak so I can like, I can help you. But when you make those noises, I want to give you some Ikea wisdom. Um, I saw this in Ikea. Uh, mistakes mean you're trying. Like when you make mistakes, it means you're trying. And so when you make that squeak, recreate it and make it again. So if you are... Oh, that's the first three notes. Well, what am I doing? I'm not pushing down. Right, so maybe I push down. Maybe I'm not pushing down quick enough. Maybe I'm not lifting quick enough. That's why you should play slow songs and broke music at first. But uh, don't worry about stabbing people. In the, uh, don't worry about stabbing people. One thing, um, you know, I had a student once, I'll tell you. She started learning cello like late 30s. You know, and she never ever read music in her life, never had played an instrument in her life, didn't even go dancing. So she had like no rhythm, no uh, idea. She just liked the cello, liked the way it looks. Really, I'm not kidding. Got a cello on Amazon, came to my studio, says, Can you teach me to play cello? I'm like, Have you learned to play instrument? No, no, never read music. Okay. 
Never in a band, no. Can you dance? No. Can you sing? No. Mm. <laughs> and in the course of about a year and a half, almost two years, she learned cello. She also played at life recital, too. And she was able to do it. So as she was making these squeaky, stabbing noises, she had a couple teenagers living with her. She had a working mom. And one day, she, um, she tells me, she, um, she tells me, uh, she comes and kind of get emotional with me in the studio. She says, you know, I had a, a moment at my, at my home, you know, yesterday I was practicing. And my teenage son says to me, you know, mom, you must be getting better because I don't have to run out of the room every time I see that thing coming out. Teenagers. Family will always tell you the truth. Well, um, and I said, dear, that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, it's a compliment. And then later on, a couple months later, she sends me a, you know, it's a picture, a text message picture of her, like kind of at her stand, take a picture. And who is in the background? Her son. And he's napping. The same son that said, I had to run out of the room. The same son that kind of gave a little jive to her was sleeping as she was playing cello, right a couple, a meter in front of him. So one day that will happen to you. One of my students today, won't name you, but one of my students says, you know, he has a, um, a little doggy, a little, little corgi. And um, he... Um, the, uh, every time he starts playing, he's, his corgi comes with his little squeak toy <laughs> and uh, starts tit, 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 like chewing it next to him. And he says, I, I make these squeaks, and so my dog go gets the squeak toy, wants to interact with me, and I guess wants to make music with me. So, so we'll see if the, ch <laughs> if the corgi continues to, to use the squeak toy. As he continues to learn cello, I try to tell him to slow things down so he doesn't squeak as much. But uh, your animals know you well. And at least they stay in the room, yeah? You know, you get a cat. If your cat stays in the room, you're doing good. All right, there, there's that. Uh, I was not a prodigy on cello, Brandon. I just played. I worked really hard. That's all. And just like you guys, I'm not a prodigy. I'm not a professional, like, of any means. Like, I didn't, I didn't go to the best schools, I didn't, I didn't get a you know, million dollar cello, I didn't know all that stuff. I was a regular kid who really liked cello, who just played it really well for a long time, and found my calling when I was 17. And I started teaching at 17 a bunch of middle schoolers that no one would teach. And that's why I do it today. That's literally when I started teaching. I was 17 years old. So it's been 22 years. And I will never stop. I love it. I love it. What's up, Elvado? Uh, Final Fantasy says, it's so hard to bump free your cello. I have loads of time. Well, yeah, I know. Anyway, I know it's a struggle. The, 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 all you guys got to do is just remember to always play songs that are accessible to you. I say that word. I'm going to ask to, um, would I discourage the use of mechanical pegs? Whoa, 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 whoa. Um, thank you, Sally, by the way. So Sally asks, hello, Sally. By the way, you always ask great questions on the channel. Every time you guys ask questions, you give me feedback. I'm not doing good enough. I play that wrong. Play great. It makes the channel better, me teaching better. And if you join me on Skype, which is great, it's kind of like this. Um, you learn a lot. It's great. I'm teaching like different continents. I'm always looking for more inspiration, so keep just asking and nail that pesky A. I know, AJ. Anyway, Sally says, how do you maintain melody line with intervals? Do you think of pressure on the bow or angle? Hmm. A melody line with intervals. I need a little more explanation as to exactly what you're asking there, so I'm going to leave that at that. How do you maintain the melody? Again, you this is the sound creator so you, your your fingers are doing what they have to do most of the time i'm just thinking put the hand in the position the fingers are a consequence of the shift and then make beautiful music with this thing right here
Paul, hello, Paula. Do you think about putting your fingers on the fingerboard a millisecond before moving the bow? No, Paula. I think about it never because I, I put the fingers down, I make the note, and then the note happens. If that's a millisecond or two, it doesn't matter. What matters is the note is played. You know that, particularly with Bach. Um, I'll play the minuet. I'm already playing the note. That's far than milliseconds above. <laughs> what you essentially are doing. You're tapping firmly and quickly enough. Firm and quick here and nice and soft here. So milliseconds is more of that. The sooner you create the note before you play Paula, the better. So th stop thinking about time differences. Create as soon as possible. I like this one better. pieces that you can play that will really push your technique and your ability to, to push down those fingers quicker. You know, that, that's it. Those fingers have to be quick. Hello, Nathan. I'm going to ask you your question. I've been learning cello. I've been wondering about lately how to play a fifth on two strings. That's a fifth. <laughs> One note after the other one, do you press the two strings at the same time with one finger or move it? Oh, good question. So, like I played earlier. There's my fifth. And you push definitely down both strings at the same time if it's a bar. And if you're playing, which is, by the way, parallel fifths they're called, they are interdi. We do not say that. We do not play that in modern music. Um, but if you did play a fifth, you can do that. Um, so two fingers down, excuse me, single finger down all the time. That's what a fifth is done. If you're playing it at the same exact time, that would be called a double stop. All right, Patrick. Welcome to the journey. And Final Fantasy started in 2004. Well, congratulations. You are now 15 years in playing cello. My dogs used to leave the room, but now they stay with me, so I guess I've improved. Yes, Charles, you have. <laughs> We learn from our mistakes. You have to make your mistakes. <laughs> that's, that's great. AJ says, I have a chihuahua and a cat. Both curl up in my bed when I play. Success. I'm terrible, but they must be forgiving. They know if you're when you're enjoying yourself. You know, I made a live stream last time. Uh, last about having a dog. My dog's over there. Being quiet. Thank goodness. Inshallah. <laughs> so... Um, but they are more attenuated to these really ultrasonic tones. And so if you're creating them less, that'd be better. Would you discourage the use of mechanical pegs? Me, no, of course not. They're great. Um, Edgar Roos put it on the five string cello. Um, so yeah, get them, both of you. Brayden asks, what would you think Yo-Yo Ma would choose besides cello? Huh. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't know. Um, I, I tell you what I would choose besides cello. You, you never know what a person likes, like outside this world. You know, I, I like really like dance music. I love to DJ. Um, I like very electronic, very modern, very, you know, technical and, uh, robotic and 
I like a lot of other genres of music, country and jazz and blues and French music and rap, a lot of, a lot of rap music. Um, so, but if I didn't play this and if I was a different person completely, not completely, but if I didn't, if I picked up a second instrument, I would play the trombone. I would play the trombone. That looks like a fun instrument because all the other instruments have keys, but the trombone, you have that slide. It's kind of like this. So I would play a trombone. And if Yo-Yo Ma is anything like me, maybe he would do something like that. He would play an instrument that resembles the cello. Um, I just like the trombone. So I wouldn't know what Yo-Yo Ma would play besides this. There is something out there. Look for an interview. I'd like to know. For those of you out there that are aware, I'm going to share with you a series that happened in the 90s. I'm going to cover it on the channel, but since you're watching, I'll give this to you. You must check out, it's a film series called Inspired by Bach. It's from Yo-Yo Ma. Check it out. It's a movie. So there's, th there's six of them. There's six little documentaries. And what he does, he collaborates with different artists of different areas. And they, they for instance, there's a gardener for the first suite. And she designs a garden based upon the first suite, all the different movements. And he plays and she designs a garden and that garden really does exist in Toronto Canada you can go to the yo-yo ma garden well, it's not a yo-yo ma garden but it's the Bach garden it really does exist go on Google Maps go in Toronto look for gardens right beside the docks it really does exist and there's a little scroll in there and there's different movements there's the cohans there's the alamand there's a gig there's a minuet there's a sacabans they're all in there the second suite is this sort of 3D rendered, um, beautiful, you got to check it out, the second suite is wonderful, Prison of the Mind. The third suite is a, is a choreography with a ballet um, choreographer. The fourth suite is, uh, what's the fourth suite, is that the, is that the movie? Uh, the fourth suite, oh, the fourth suite's a Kabuki theater, um, yeah, or the fourth suite. One of them is a kabuki theater um, act. Uh, no, it's the fifth suite. The fifth suite is a kabuki theater actor from Japan. Really, really good. You should watch that one. The fourth suite's a movie. It's a full-on movie. So that's good. And the sixth suite is with some ice dancers. Some of the most famous ice dancers in the world. It's called Inspired by Bach. It's all Yo-Yo Ma in the 1990s, long before there was Google and anything. It's not in great quality, but it is fantastic. And those recordings are great too. You can buy the recordings on Amazon, but the movie, you have to watch the movie. It's great, it's fantastic. All right. Speaking of fingers, Christine, hello, Stufflebeam, Christine Stufflebeam. Do you play fingers arc or flatter? My teacher is trying to ha have me lift them up. All right, Christine, there's a thing about the fingers, right? You want to have them arced. You want to use the tips of them. You want to have these, les doigts de grenouille. J'ai des doigts de grenouille. C'est en français, I have fingers, frog fingers. So you want to use the tips of your fingers. None of this flat stuff, nice and arced up. Your thumb doesn't have to remain on the same part in the back of the neck. I discovered this recently with a student. She was having a problem when I told her it's not stuck there all the time you can move it up you can move it as you go throughout the strings you can here move it to the side a little bit it's fluid back there align with the second yes but you can slide it up to give you more clearance because <laughs> flat I'm going to touch that open A you have to have clearance so more art not flat hey Jay what's up AJ you said you if my fingers can't reach all of the first bridges with this should I consider 7 8th absolutely you know your anatomy and one thing I do on this channel and how I, I say all the time, we are all anatomically different. That means you know your body the best. And if you're joining cello at a later time in life, your skeleton structure isn't as malleable as it was prior when we were much younger. 
You've already developed it, and, and you've already sort of solidified it. You can make adjustments, but it will be doing what it does. And if your fingers are not going to do that, try 7 eighths. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's no problem at all. Three quarters a bit small. You find you may be cramped, but 7 eighths should work for most of us. You know, there's some um, um, famous cellists that play tiny cellos. They're big guys with tiny cellos, so don't worry about it. You can play smaller cellos. The double, I play a bass, by the way, Final Fantasy. I play the double bass. I am, um, I play a bass, bass guitar. Not well, but I play it when I cover things. <laughs> um, I know, someone will play the flute. Well, that's good for you. I'll play the trombone. I really like the flute. I think it's pretty. I really think it's pretty. Hey, hey, Meepo2842. Can you suggest a simple song to start with? I'm a beginner. I've only had three lessons. Yes. There's a simple song you can start with. Quite simple. And I'm going to do this temporarily, and hopefully my computer won't crash. <laughs> All right, it's, it's going to pull this up again. I'm, I'm going to hopefully... I was running too many programs. There is a limit to the power of... Let's see if it's going to go. It's supposed to come through. Oh, it's all right. It's there. So I need my music. That's my iPad, right? All right. Please don't crash. <laughs> There's a simple song that you can play. Absolutely. You can play "Ode an der Freude" or "Ode to Joy," and I'm gonna really show you more about what this is about. Uh, we that here. No, let's do the first one. Ah, here we go. You are seeing everyone watching the very first time the world heard this tune. Happens in one of the many movements of the fourth movement of the Ninth Symphony of Beethoven. <laughs> to joy it's played in D major it's played on the D string and the very first time the world heard that melody was played by the cello section and that is not arranged that is the actual notes that the symphony plays so if you want to learn a piece learn learn Ode to joy I thought that <laughs> and a more simple version would be found elsewhere not there so a simple version would be found let me find that real quick Ode on the Freude, which is literally the words that they use, and there it is. My suggestion for playing songs when you first begin: play songs that you know, excuse me, that you know by heart. So any song that you know by heart. Usually they're nursery rhymes or things like that. So that's what I suggest you play, like that. Songs that you know. Beethoven always. <laughs> <sighs> anyway. Do, 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 so. By the way, for those of you talking about the bagpipes, for those of you talking about, uh, for those of you talking about the bagpipes, I'm gonna see if any of you. Uh, what happened to it? It's it's this guy. I gotta go to the student. 
For those of you talking about the bagpipes. <laughs> If you had only one scale to learn, which would it be? Ooh, great question, Hack and Play. If I had only one scale to learn, which would it be? The chromatic scale. <laughs> Here's another question from Nathan. How do you play a very long note? When I have changes in the direction of the bow while still playing a note, I can't avoid the bow direction chain sound. That is advanced technique question, and it will require a bit of, um, how can I say, a bit of <sighs> gentle playing? Not this song. Huh. It's not here. There is a. I, I'm. Where is it? Oh, geez. I'm. I'm looking for. I'm looking for something by Bach, and I'm going to go into my Bach section. Here we go. Ah. There we go. Ave Maria. I had a really, 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 really long note, you know. You have <laughs> it's hard to hide it. Especially if you're alone in a room. It's harder here. You have to sort of think of like a feather. You're lightly lifting and you're placing. You're lightly lifting and you're placing. And it's really here in your wrist. You're lightly lifting and you're placing. It takes, it takes practice. It takes really knowing your, your bow, the weight of your bow, the weight distribution of your bow. It's a great question though, Nathan. Does the violin linger in the cello a bit? Does the violin linger? And if you're asking, absolutely. Our, our whole pedagogy is based upon, is based upon um, the violin. Why is it called first position? Because if you're playing, or second position, or third position. Because if you played a violin, your first, second, third would be on the A, on the B, the C sharp, and the D. So yeah, of course it lingers in cello. We all play, and honestly, we all play violas. We don't. We all play the viol. It's a viola family. The violin is just a smaller version of the viola, and this is a larger version of the viola. The five fifths, uh, like that. So an Italian instrument. No, je suis américain. J'habite ici en France. Um, J'adore la France, mais je suis américain. Um, toujours, je suis en train de apprendre français. And désolé, c'est ma prononciation, c'est totalement nul, mais j'essaye. J'essaye. Un jour, euh, un jour, je vais euh, lancer une, une course sur mon, mon chan euh, en français, mais il faut, euh, je dois améliorer ma prononciation. Je comprends beaucoup, mais euh, j'ai parlé. Euh, bon, j'ai parlé nul, <rire> comme ça. Uh, so, merci, Daniel Lebel. Hmm. 
<laughs> Sophia says, Buitron says, um, Sophia says, um, I can't reach fifth to seventh position without making scratchy sounds. Any advice? What is a fifth position? <laughs> That's seventh. That's sixth. That is uh, fifth. How you, why are you making scratchy noises? Watch the earlier part of this video. You're probably thinking too much here. You're, you're, you're thinking too much about your fingers, you know? You're thinking too much. You're probably doing that. So without seeing you play, uh, that's all I can tell you. Um... <laughs> Go practice. Why do violinists uh, t smack talk violas? I don't know. I think that's a joke. I, don't, I think that's a joke coming from Lopaka79. I know. Uh, uh, I like to know why. How do I know if I'm to play the notes open or on the second string? Ah, that, that depends upon the quality. Here's a rule, hack and play, about playing open strings. Is you want to avoid at least the open A. Yeah? It just depends. It depends upon the quality. It is better to play here. If you're playing with a group, let's say you're playing um, a group of people, and you're playing... Now for the first series of those beautiful canon, which I absolutely love, you will probably want to play the open strings. Because it sets the tonality of the play tune. But then afterward, you have people coming in. By the way, that's a Baroque piece, and if you watched, you've been here since like 20 minutes ago, that is not supposed to be played with vibrato. music hook. So when the everyone comes in, the rule about open strings is they're selfish. It's very selfish to play an open string when everyone else is playing. Everyone risks playing string instruments being out of tune. So if you played here, even though that's a little bit off, that's okay. comes it becomes much more fluid and much more what have you call it much more um uh, there's a lot more music happening then you can maybe hit, hit an open D to get everyone sort of back on the tonality so that's the rule of open strings it's selfish to play them because you know you're right but everyone else is probably a little bit off and that makes everyone sound bad did Paganini have cello music I don't think so but stuff has been arranged Stuff has been arranged for that. Um, and so to leave all of you, I think that's the last of it. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. That's the last of my comments. No more. I'm done. Oh, okay, we're done.
Ah, okay, Sophia. If you were to, to give an example of the passage in the piece, then I can look at it a little bit better. But more jumbled. Maybe I'm, you're talking... <laughs> When you are playing up here in these positions, I think you really have to engage and pull the cello into your body. You really have to pull it in. You have to really bring it in. And if you aren't doing that, pulling, if you're pushing, pulling is a little bit better. And really understanding that these shapes that you're creating need to be solid, need to be really pushed onto the fingers. Um, without an example, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't know. Um, um, if you're playing stuff that's fast, you really have to have, you know, strong um, engagement here at the same time, strong engagement on your bow, so. Best way to practice, just call me E, just tune in. Uh, the Humoresque from, I think uh, she's talking about this, which is um, book three. Let me, let me pull up book three. This, if you're talking about this high, Joachim, um, if this song, and oh, this is a different human I'm, I'm probably, if this is it, I'm, I'm going to wait for Sophia to say. Um, there are many human or are you talking about the human from Popper? So I'm going to see what she says to that. We'll soon have to go, everyone. Um, Book three is great. You know, some people butcher this poor song. So I'm going to play a little bit. Uh, they, they, uh, these songs are always butchered by people. Hi, JVTS. I love the third book of Suzuki. It's fantastic. Love it. And I absolutely love. I know it's yeah, it's a Suzuki book. Okay, there it is. So she says that. Hello, the magnetic dude. Hi. So she's talking about up here. show you this. Oh, hopefully, can I, can I, am I getting that in the feed? Everyone, we're getting that. Okay, we're getting that in the feed. I'm going to show you about this. This is the most difficult part of the piece. Now that right there, that part right there is the most difficult because it's a big spread. And... the 2-2 two, two slide. You're really engaging and you're coming down nice and thick on that note right there. And then after that Yes, I change the fingerings. I go to the harmonic. Engaging there. This position right here, the seventh position, put your th put your thumb on the G. That is a good a position to learn. Um yeah, so hope I helped you out with that, with that one. Right, I'm gonna play something and then go. Um maybe not. I'm just not gonna play anything. I've been, I've been working some, um, a lot of tunes, a lot of tunes, a lot of tunes, um, a lot of tunes, a lot of tunes. There's, you're like looking at actually everything that I'm playing right now, so there's a lot of stuff. Look at that. For all of you out there, bam, 
You know I love that. <laughs> anyway. Um. Ooh, thank you again, Lopaka. Any chance you could do a video on the song Julio by Mark Summer? You Thank you again for all your hard work on putting the teaching now. You're welcome, you're welcome, welcome. Julio, again, I want to talk about these devices I'm using, these iPad Pro, use an iPad, get rid of paper, stop that already. Save with somebody, get an iPad. I'll tell you why. Watch this. Where is it? Here it is. <laughs> you know what you're looking at right now? You are looking at a photo. I was, here we go, <laughs> here we go. I was at a, a guy's house, and um, he had the sheet music to this. And I literally took a photo of it, and there you go. There's Julio. For those of you who aren't familiar with Julio, it's by Mark Summer. And he, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, the cellist of the Turtle Island String Quartet. Turtle Island String Quartet, remember that. And um, I haven't played it in a very long time. And I don't know if I'm going to embarrass myself on live. Uh, um, but I will. It's, it's not up to, you know, playing live right now. Um, uh, but it's beautiful. It's beautiful, and there's there's lots of fun stuff in it. But I took a picture of it, and then I made a PDF. This I'm literally playing the picture I took, and so um, I'll I'll do it eventually. It's a beautiful song. It's a beautiful song. It's actually uh, based upon some Celtic music. So yes, in the near future, in the foreseeable some odd future, I have other songs I like to do. So definitely that will happen. That will happen. And and you you keep sending these. Thank you. Keep sending these wonderful, um, you know, if you want to sponsor a video, Lopaka, and anyone watching, you want to sponsor a video, get in contact with me. I do a lesson, a video, and a cover, and I will, if you sponsor that, I will do it. I will do it. So, uh, <laughs> I will do it. <laughs> it's in the queue, and the queue is kind of long, but it's in there. It's in there. I've, I've always wanted to play this. I've never just been pushed to do it. Um, but it's fun. It's a fun tune. It's a different tune. Um, oh yeah, Brayden. Of course I'll do Elgar. You know, a lot of you asked for that tune. And um, I don't think that's... Um, that's um, let me find them real quick. I have it. I actually have it in my queue. Here is in my queue. It's, it's uh, here it is. Oh, there it is. For those of you who are new to cello, by the way, this is something called Music Minus One. I'll do a review on this. Music Minus One is like what um, some, uh, Tom Play, like Tom Play, but with CDs. Before that was Tom Play, there's a company called Music Minus One. And this has got this really, really pretty. You know, introduction. By the way, the Elgar is pretty, but I only like the first movement. The other two movements are just, just not. I have to uh, remember what I was doing. Okay, I have to remember what I was doing. It's some stuff there. I'll do that. Everyone asked about that tune. Since it's the beginning of it, I don't care about the rest of it. Um, thank you, Charles. Charles, thank you for the super chat. Thanks to everyone who tunes in. 
Um, thanks to everyone, all of you guys. Um, just call me E. So Travis Scott, I'm going to um, jump jump ahead. Um, you're welcome, Sophia, Sally, everyone. You're absolutely welcome. Um, thank you, uh, Fleur Flop. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk to you. Just call me E. Because by the way, when you ask questions like Just Call Me E does, I'm going to give you keep it real. Travis Scott is from my hometown. I grew up in Houston, Texas. I believe he's from Houston. I believe he's Texas. I believe he's from Houston. So, you know, just call me E. You always leave comments. Leave a comment or on other chat. This oh, uh, uh, one, uh, one video that he uh, that you would sound good on cello. Um, but yeah, come on, Houston hip hop. Got to give it up, right? <laughs> um, I love my iPad Pro. Paula says I use the Air Turn pedal. I have a lot of music and I digitize. And I, I, um, which I can download to Fourscore. And she's talking about what I'm showing you right now. This is Fourscore right there. There it is, Fourscore. And I have thousands, thousands of apps of songs on that. And she's talking about this. This is an air turn. I've been using it. I had to replace this. And if you have bought any other pedal besides this one, Bluetooth pedal, you have, I'm sorry, you've wasted your money. And the reason is, this is modular. You will break and wear this pedal out. And I have gone through the Page Flip Chicata, three of them, and I have gone through other ones, and this one is modular. This piece actually broke. This is a digit. This is a unit with your hand, and it connects well to this. I've had this for, geez, six, seven years. I've been using Air Turn uh, for, um, by the way, it's an American company. I've used an air turn since I got the iPad in 2011. I don't know, 2012, but I discovered it later. Air turn is a company that's, why is it called air turn? Well, because they got their start by helping people that ha are um, quadriplegics or paraplegics to turn the pages of, particularly quadriplegics, to turn the pages of a book. And so they would have these two tubes they would blow into, and with their air, they would turn the pages. Hence, the company is called Air Turn, and that's how they started. And they've been doing it forever, and they just went into Bluetooth stuff. So support a company that's been helping disabled people for longer than probably the both of us have been alive. So anyway, thank you, Charles, very much so. Braden, you're from Houston. Sweet. <laughs> Lyle Violin Shop. Lyle Violin Shop. Lyle Violin Shop. The OG Luthier of Houston, Texas. Lyle Violin Shop. Violins.com? That's Lyle Violin Shop. They're the OG. And I got my cello from them. And I, I, I love them. Um... Yeah, Clear Lake's great. Clear Lake's great. Um, Clear Lake is great. Um, I didn't live there. I lived near it. If you want to know, I lived in Sagemont. <laughs> if you, that's a, but I went to HSPVA, the high school for the performing and visual arts. And if you are in Houston, Texas, and you play a cello, you probably know what the school is. The best school ever in... My little girl, my niece, Lily, and Luna. Lily, I know you'll go there, but Luna, good luck. My niece is, ed is auditioning for HSPVA. Everyone, hope you wish her luck. Put her in your prayers. And Luna, I'm looking out for you. Hope you do good. Well, I think you're telling German dude. So, anyway. Oh, so Brayden, you went to PVA. Well, there you go. Small world. Small world. PVA is great. Okay, okay, okay. There's, that's, that's, a, that's three songs of uh, Just Call Me E. So um, you got to find one, all right? I'll listen to them. I listen to some songs. They got to sound good on cello. Just remember that, all right? It's got to sound good on cello. Oh, you didn't? Oh, okay. So, all right. Well. So.
You probably have checked out Lyle by Lynch Shop right Raiden. Right. Anyway. Uh, cool. Well, I'm going to go and uh, have some food. I don't know what time it is here. It's about that time for me to go and have food elsewhere. And so I want to thank everyone for tuning in to this live stream. Um, I'm always learning. Again, love when you guys ask questions. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. I'm going to give a special Thanksgiving offering to two of my students on Skype. I really want to appreciate them. And Thanksgiving is a time we do give thanks. We give. And if you can't prepare something beautiful for your family and friends, I suggest you do so. It's a beautiful thing to do. Um, uh, but I'm preparing a couple of songs for some of my students. And we'll, and we'll be launching them on Thanksgiving weekend as a thank you to them. And just to th just in general, it's just th giving thanks, giving thanks to the wonderful blessing of playing music. So, anyway. So, hello, Francesco. <laughs> I don't have an accent, by the way. <laughs> maybe sometimes I do. I don't have an accent. Uh, maybe I do. It's okay. It's okay. Ha. Um, do I have an accent? A Texas accent? I don't know. Originally saxophonist, and quite recently I picked up the cello after a long time. I really enjoyed it. Oh, that was another instrument I would have played. Chestnuts roasting no an open fire. Won't sing enough of it, but that is what I would love to play. By the way, love that on cello. Anyway, bon appetit. Well, everyone, thank you. And God bless each and every one of you. May the universe shine its heavenly light on all of us. And... Go out there and practice. Thank you for tuning in. Bye-bye. And thanks for retuning in, too, after the stream fell. <laughs> uh, yeehaw.